one of the things I had my wife, I'm not a Facebook person or any of that stuff. So my wife does that, and she called me and said, you got to look at this picture. So I pulled my phone and look at it. It's a picture of the roof of the three car, and it says Jordan Taylor, and it says not dreaming. <laughs> that tells you how, how much heart the kid has, you know. And then uh, after the race, he finished. we finished second with a three car. There's a picture of him driving home with the trophy strapped in the passenger seat of his car. So that, that, that tells you what kind of heart the kid has, and that it's pretty exciting to have uh, Antonio full-time in the three car is really cool. He, he'd only driven the long races in the three and the four, and uh, he, he's very excited to be there. Um, he did a terrific job. You know, Long Beach was rough on him, not being there, having to, you know, go into turn one as fast as he had to go in there, you know. He, the car got dinged up, but he did an awesome job getting through there and, uh, you know, bringing the car home forth there was was awesome. Uh, Oliver and Tommy did a great job. Uh, Richard only runs the long races in the four car. He's a great addition to the team. He, you know, did a great job last year and uh, continuing the same. So I think when we, we go to France and uh, all six drivers, both cars, both teams are going to be ready to go 100% and we'll see what we have. I'll share a little Jordan story with you. Jordan doesn't fit the mold that we would normally look at for endurance drivers. Uh, historically, for endurance racing, because you're sharing the car, you need guys that are patient. You look at a, a, a curve of a driver's career, you know, time versus skill level, and, and, and in the past, the most successful formula has been, you know, chop off the top of that curve and find a guy that's just about peaking or a guy who's maybe just past his peak because he's going to be patient. He's not going to have a desire to do something else. He's not going to really want to be a Formula One guy. And so this is the stepping stone. Um, you know, he's learned enough that he's not going to be so anxious to stick the car in when he shouldn't. And that's been a very, very, very successful formula for us over the years. Jordan, obviously, is way down here, experience and youth. So when it, and, but, but he had been driving in, in Grand Am. So when it was suggested that we give him a test, I said, well, you know, it doesn't really fit what we do. And he, he was 19 years old. Are you kidding me? Can't we, you know, maybe we season him for a few more years. Well, why don't you just give him a test? Okay, fine. So we bring him out with a couple of other guys. And, and, and he shows up. And, and as Dan said, you know, <laughs> he raced with Wayne, as did I. Uh, I had the Oldsmobile program in WSC where Wayne was there. And Wayne is a very unique individual on so many different <laughs> levels. <laughs> to have his kid was my nightmare on Elm Street, too. <laughs> number one, who knows what the kid was going to be like. And number two, I got to be dealing with his old man again? No. <laughs> I was there too when he was born. I think I dated his mom in high school. I'm not sure. <laughs> At any rate, he shows up for the test. And I, I had met, I, I, I knew him as a kid growing up. So he shows up, shake hand, fine. I said, you know, here we go, back in the trailer, there's your locker, do the whole thing. So I, I got my eye on him. He shows up and he's got his little bag and he sets it down on the table. He unzips it, he's got all his stuff folded up in there, puts it on the table, he smooths it down, he gets it all lined up, he gets his, his stuff off, he takes, gets his uniform on, he takes his stuff, folds it all up, smooths it all down, puts it back in the bag, zips it up, slides. I'm thinking this kid is like from the military, this is too good to be true. <laughs> he was absolutely, totally focused on the job, it's all he had on his mind wasn't nervous, was at least outwardly, was not at all intimidated, got in the car, gave tremendous feedback, and went really, really, really fast. <laughs> right then, I knew that you could take this curve, throw it in the trash can, and we need to figure out how we need to get Jordan Taylor hooked up. And, and, and it is a dream come true for him, obviously. I mean, there a, a, a lineup of guys in that paddock, and I don't care if you're running the Audi R18, Every one of those drivers wants to be a Corvette race car driver because they see all the things that they have in you people and all the things that we do. Their number one job would be driving for a Corvette. And as, as a and now 20 year old, he's got that job. Um, I think we're gonna see great things from him. He has no desire to do open wheel cars. He has no desire to go to NASCAR. He has no desire to do anything else but drive Corvette for the rest of his life. 
And, and when he says that, and you watch him, you, you know you know that's the real deal. He, he, he believes in that, and uh, I think we're going to get uh, get a lot of good mileage out of him. And, 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 and by the way, his dad's under control, too. <laughs> As I told his dad when he called me up, and he's from South Africa, so he's got that little South African accent, which I can't imitate, but he says, uh, Doug, I'm, I'm calling him up, Jordan. I said, you know, it, Wayne, I was waiting for this call. I said, but before we go any further, well, let me explain something to you. As far as your son driving for us, you get one phone call, and this is it. So make it good. And he did. And he, it's called, been, he called me. Yeah. So now he calls Dan all the time. Never called him. Ted? I just wanted to tell my Jordan Taylor story, too. Because uh, I... They don't consult me on who the drivers are going to be, but you know I find out when I get Charlie Robertson's notice. You know who's driving for the team. Um, That's how we find out too. <laughs> so I'm like, who the hell is this kid? I don't understand it. But uh, I was down at Sebring, happened to be in the pit, standing there when he got out of his first stint at Sebring. So here's this kid getting out of this world-class race car on a world stage at Sebring, and he was so cool. I commented to Doug, it's like. I'm sweating way more than he is. He's been out there mixing it up with these guys for two hours. You know, his glasses aren't fogged up. You know, it's just super cool, super comfortable getting out of the car. I'm standing there sweating bullets. So this kid's got just iron. I mean, this guy, he's, he's something special for sure. We are lucky to have him. Yes, sir. Uh, is there any technology? Oh, uh, we'll get back here. Go, go back here and I'll come back to you. I didn't see this back. Yes, technology. Uh, is there any uh, sharing of some technologies between uh, the Rolex Racing and Ems and the IMSA Corvette? Well, and let me give some explanation on to the, 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 you heard the question. We're looking at the Rolex series uh, Daytona prototype Corvette. So you understand what that is and I won't go into the deep political ramifications of it. Essentially, Pratt & Miller was charged by Chevrolet to develop Corvette bodywork to provide identity for cars racing in the Grand Am series. In order to be able to purchase a Corvette body, you must be running, obviously, a Chevrolet engine. But the cars themselves are not what you would consider, certainly not at the level at which we race in the American Le Mans series, Corvette factory cars. As a matter of fact, I think there's three chassis that utilize that body right now. I think there's a Dallara, a Riley, and a Coyote that happen to have the Corvette bodywork on them and happen to have Chevrolet engines in them. Now, from a corporate involvement standpoint, we, we help facilitate their ability to procure the body, the fact that they're running Chevrolet engines, there are there is some, a little bit of technology transfer there, but those are independent race teams running independent of one another and essentially running for the most part independent of the factory. So it's not at, at all at the level of which we race Corvette. Does that answer your question? Do you have anything more specific that I can? Well, I was wondering more about the engine technology. Well, those guys are free to choose which engine builder they want. Okay. okay, so you might have some guy using a children's motor and some guy using somebody else's and some guy using a K-Tech. Dan? Yeah, basically it's wide open. It's no different than if you had a Chevrolet stock car. You can get an engine from RCR or anybody. So it makes it hard for us to help them if they're getting engines from all different people. Basically, you know, we at Pratt Miller designed the body to be aero, you know, stable, faster than the other cars, you know, and, and that's what we've done. And then um, they can actually hire an uh, engineer from Pratt Miller to go with them and, and to do some of the engineering stuff that we do to help them, but it's not, that's not our 100% deal. We just help them along. So it's a, you know, it's kind of at arm's length kind of thing. They're independent guys, they want to be independent. So, you know, we give them a little bit of help when they ask, or a little bit of help when they pay for it. But other than that, it's, 
It's, it's not what, what, we're, what we have here, not even close. Blogger. I hadn't read Murphy the Bear, but I think he just went to the mine. His batting average is about .186 on uh, rumors. Every once in a while, these strikes go old. Uh, Peter DiLorenzo, pretty switched on guy. Um, and not sure where he picked up on that. I can tell you, just from our perspective on this stage today, our focus is on this year's racing, next year's racing, design and development of Y1. There has been no mention, no emphasis, no conversation about that direction changing. None whatsoever. So, you know, you know anybody can talk about anything. You know, winning overall the law is a, is a huge thing. Um, you know, would, would Cadillac be interested in that phrase? Would Cadillac be the LNP car? What is today certainly isn't tomorrow, and it's not going to be what it is in 2014. Our focus and our, objection, uh, our objective is, I mean, laser beam focused on Y1, period. We don't have time inside the Corvette group to be thinking about anything else, and we're not. So, without categorically coming out and saying, I know everything going on in General Motors, I can tell you, within our group, that, that, that hasn't even lifted the needle off the peg. We haven't even joked about it at lunchtime. So I would say that they are wrong. Yeah, you know, it's not like there's a lot to learn, quite frankly. I mean, I don't mean to overstate that or make like end all. The technology transfers. There isn't, being as nice as I can, there isn't a whole lot they're doing that we can learn from. We're, we were way past that a long time ago. Back to you, I'm sorry. It's just a truck and trailer that we only use for Le Mans. Right, and we, we right now it has uh, two sets of bodywork, one for each car already done. Um, they haven't finished the numbers yet, but there's just a little bit of stickers that are decals that we need to put on there. All the hard parts are in there, uh, nuts and bolts, peanut butter and jelly, I mean everything. You can't imagine what we take there. Um, 80,000 pounds. Golf clubs and bicycles. <laughs> and we have that as well. <laughs> but if anybody's played at a French golf course. <laughs> you got it's a little sketchy. But anyways, um, so we filled that thing up with all the parts and pieces. It's already left. Um, Monday this week, they got all the crates down. We have about 30 crates that we fill up with parts and pieces, wheels, tires, all the bodywork. Um, we ship about 32 tons of parts and cars and pit equipment and wheel guns. Literally everything goes in those crates in an airplane. They come uh, the Tuesday... Uh, a week following uh, Laguna. So we have basically five days to get ready, and that's plenty of time, believe it or not. Every crate has a list of everything that's in it, and we've been doing that for years. And they know, you know, box 12 has all of this stuff, all the suspension, sway bars, whatever. So if we have a problem, 
they know where box 12 is. And we organize it before the race by sort of sections, front, middle, and rear of the car. Um, we have the engine guy stuff. Uh, we take six engines per car. We take, uh, I think this year we're going to have six transmissions. So we'll have four primary race transmissions and two practice transmissions. So the undertaking is phenomenal. The amount of effort and work by all of the guys, you just can't believe that it can happen in that amount of time. But they've done it over and over again. And, and having the list and being organized is the key. And you create that list by virtue of having made every mistake possible. <laughs> Remembering each one and trying not to duplicate it. Well, exactly. You think that you wouldn't even think about. We have an American truck that we take to France. One year it got a flat tire. We had to fly, we had to buy an airplane ticket for the tire to ship it there. And on the side of the road, they were waiting for it. So now we take Because they don't have that tire size in Europe. They don't have that tire size in Europe. It's just a disaster. So you have to think of literally everything. You know, try to get a quarter 20 bolt in France. You can't do it. You have to bring it. And what that has done is other teams from America come straight to us. We are the parts. We are the parts warehouse. <laughs> How many people have been to France? Okay. That's awesome. Do you know what the most valuable commodity in France is besides deodorant? <laughs> it's ice. You can't get ice. Well, you order ice for your drink, they may bring you a, a cube. Literally, a cube. We have two ice machines. We are the largest single producer of ice in the entire country of France for the three weeks we're in the month. And we do supply all the American teams. Absolutely. They come by that night with a bag and they <laughs> fill it up and away they go. <laughs> we learned that right away. Anything else? Yes, sir. It's a little bit different. The engine, the restrictors, all those things are the same. The stuff that we modify or change is the underwing on the bottom of the nose and the wing, the wing angle, the how it goes down the straightaway. You spend so much time there on the straightaway compared to a racetrack even in a, you know, Road America you think it's a fast track, but you have to have the most downforce as possible. Le Mans is a trade-off. You have to get down the straightaway as fast as you can. And that's where our car, you know, shines. We spend, uh, you know, the whole day at Oscoda running back and forth down the straightaway, trimming that thing out. Where does it make enough downforce to get through the corners but get down the straightaway? It's all arrow changes. The rules are the, the, the rules are the same. The rules are consistent, so there's not a lot of difference there. Yeah. Real quick, uh, next year or we can't go, we'll be running the 60th anniversary Corvette colors for next year. I know we did the long loop back in every year. Mm -hmm. We will be running the 60th anniversary commemorative yellow. I, I love the blue cars, but it wasn't very good for us. Yeah, I got called into the president's office. And it would have been easier to go to the president in Washington, D.C. than it was the president at the Renzen. <laughs> and I got an earful from that guy. We will be running yellow. <laughs> yes, sir. You know, uh, when I hear your answer to a question... I remember from yesterday, okay. <laughs> like, uh, it's inside joke. Uh, you've got incredible experience with regard to direction of teams and drivers. I know where to get an engineering degree. I wonder where you got that experience from, managerial experience for race teams. Just being really old, um, you know, and, and, and not unlike the gentleman t to my left, I was blessed and fortunate enough to come be raised in, in a household and in an environment that was automotive based and automotive related. Uh, both my grandfather and my father were in the hands-on automotive industry. My grandfather had car dealerships and my father was in the auto body repair business, so we were always in and around race cars. And uh, well, I'll give Dan a minute here to tell his side of it, but you can't help but, and in Detroit, I mean, you don't really have an option. Um, you know, it, it, becomes, it becomes part of you. You know, 
we all in this room, I think, had an interest in cars from an early age. Well, not only did I have an interest in it, but I was immersed in it. And when that occurs, you have opportunity. And and it was this wasn't something that I ever planned on doing. It wasn't a career goal. I never dreamed I would be standing up here. I was going to be an architect. But it just it's amazing how this industry works and how how cars can get a hold of you. It's a, like I say, it's a bad drug. Uh, I swore off it. I swore off it two or three different times and had two or three other different very successful careers. But eventually was lured back, asked back, and it's not something you can say no to when you want you once you've been there. So it's just a, a personal experience. I, you know, not unlike Dan, I had my own race team, learned some stuff. You're in Detroit. I knew the contacts, you know, started doing work for manufacturers. One thing led to another. And it's, you know, it was just one of those things that evolved. And, and when you, you know, I, I've said this before, but I don't care if it's racing or the restaurant business or the clothing business. When you think about it, it doesn't matter how good a product you have if you don't have the right people, and if you don't have the right people from behind the scenes to the front person, you're not going to be successful. This world operates on people, not product. And, and, and I learned that very, very early being in an in a entire family that was always self-employed. You learn the importance of people. They're not just holes with pegs in them. You know, they're individuals, and they all want to succeed, and you have to learn about them, you have to learn what their goals and desires are, and then you have the ability to take and place them in a position that's going to be most pleasing to them, where they're going to do their best work, and consequently the whole thing gets better. You just learn that early on, and I, I, would, I was blessed with that opportunity to do that. That's how I got there, Dan. Um, I started racing with my dad. My dad raced bug eye sprites and MGAs and all kinds of crazy stuff like that. Um, he got a start, he raced in 1949 for the first time, and raced in 19 or uh, 2011, that was his last race, so it was a pretty awesome career, but I, I grew up working on that, learning how to bleed the brakes when I was like six years old because my mom was cooking dinner, you know, <laughs> so, um, and then, you know, one thing led to another, I, I figured out that I might be able to make a living racing cars, not just doing it on the weekends and, and working on junk cars during the week to pay for it, and uh, then I got hooked up with a guy named Tommy Kendall, um, we were able to win a lot of races, which was unbelievable. We won uh, nine championships in 13 years, uh, and that's where I met Doug about halfway through that. We got hooked up at Cars and Concepts Racing Berettas, and uh, uh, next thing you know, 30 years have gone by. So For me, for me here, here's the thing. I use the GM axiom. Find something you think is going someplace and get right in behind it. Okay? And that's what you're able to do. When, you, when I met Dan, I, 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 I knew we had something good here. And so I worked very hard to provide environments that we could leverage what Dan brought and what all the other guys on the team brought. And that's how you succeed, is with people. So you're saying it was both of you's destiny? Well, there's no question. You didn't have a choice? Yeah, we began dating about seven years ago. 